So, today we are going to start a new series of sermons called The Church Unleashed, like, uh, like Charlie said earlier. I thought this would be a good time to do this since uh, this is kind of a new chapter in the life of our church. We are really going to take 10 weeks to look at the church and God's vision for the church, what God has for us as the church and why we're here. That's really what we're focusing on today. And so I thought it'd be a good, good time to do it. New chapter. Also, I know there are a, a number of new people here today as I was greeting at the door. Folks told me that this is their first or second time. So I think as these weeks progress, we'll probably have some new folks coming who are checking out our church, wondering what we're about. So you come for the next 10 weeks and you'll know what we're about. But you have to come every week. That's the important part. No. So let me read this passage of scripture uh, that talks about the vision of the church, God's vision for the church. Before I do that, let's pray together. Father, we thank you that uh, your Holy Spirit is present here this morning just as it was at the birth of the church so many years ago. I pray that today you, your spirit would speak to us in power and with clarity and with full conviction. Lord, may our hearts be open to your truth today, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So here's the scripture for today, a very familiar passage, I think, for all of us, or most of us. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. I've always loved that verse. I have to just say that. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. It's great that the gospel writer threw that in there. Shows us it's not a propaganda document, that it's truthful, and that doubt is part of the Christian life, right? Some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, 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 emphasizing go here, go, <laughs> go and make disciples of all nations, ethnos, all ethnic groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So the name of this series is The Church Unleashed. And if we could have the uh, logo up there right now, that would be great. Charlie made fun of it, so I got to defend it. <laughs> Here it is, The Church Unleashed, the logo. It's coming up <laughs> momentarily, any second now. It is coming. This is my fault. I did not warn them that I was doing that. Okay. Sorry about that. Remember the logo? It was horses running. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. My fault. Okay. The last church I served, every once in a while, I would stop and I would stop my message and I'd have talk, people talk to each other. And every time I did that, they told me, Steve, you know when you stop talking during your message and you had us talk to each other? That was really good. You should do that more often. So we're going to do that today. What I want you to do is just turn to the person next to you and I want you to look at this photo, this logo, and what does it tell you? What feelings are evoked by this picture of these horses. And what could it tell us about the church? What I want you to do is just think of words that could come to your mind, like power. You know, horses are powerful uh, creatures. So power could be one of them. This is a picture of God's vision for the church. Go ahead and talk amongst each other for about 10 seconds or so, and then we'll come back together. Okay, if one person has done all the talking, make sure the other person has a chance. Go ahead, keep talking. Okay, so 
What are some of the words? Go ahead and just raise your hand. What are some of the words you came up with? Freedom. Exactly. Boy, don't, those horses are free as opposed to being in a corral and leased and stuck in a barn. No, they're free. They're running. What else? Together, unity, they're running in the same direction. They're running together, right? Okay, what else? Speed. Speed. Yeah, they're fast. Okay. Power, Power. absolutely. Horses are powerful creatures. (laughs) Yeah, what else? Joy. Joy. I came up with that one too. (laughs) They're doing what they've been created to do, aren't they? They are not created to be in a corral. What else? Anything else? What's that? Strength, leadership. Okay, what else? What's that? On the move. They're moving. They're going. Okay, these are all great words. We'll keep working on this in the weeks ahead. But those are words, really, every one of them, that describe the mission, the vision of the church, power, movement, freedom, set loose, going. Often not the words we use or we think of when we think of the church. Boy, the church has been getting a lot of bad press lately. Talking about its waning influence, declining membership, all the rest. Probably not the words that would come to our mind when we read those articles and yet, This is God's vision for the church. And perhaps we don't see it any more clearly than in these verses I just read from the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Here's the situation. Jesus is speaking to his 11 disciples. He has done his ministry. He's been crucified. He's been resurrected. He's appeared to the disciples at different times. This is the last time he's going to speak to them. So he's giving them their marching orders. And he says to them, you know what? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And now you go. You go. You go. And make disciples of all the nations. What? Baptizing them. Teaching them to obey everything I have told you. And then this great promise. And surely I will be with you to the very close of the age. Wow. Pretty bold statement. Don't you think? I mean, here's this Jesus born to peasant parents in a backwater, really, province of the Roman Empire. Grew up working as a a carpenter. Never held public office. Never wealthy. (laughs) Good laugh over there. (laughs) Never wealthy. Died a criminal's death. And here he has the audacity to say, you know what? All authority, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now here's something even more audacious. He's saying to these 11 ordinary guys, I'm passing it on to you. I'm giving it to you. You go. I'm empowering you. And here's my strategy. You ex-fishermen, or you fishermen and ex-prostitutes and ex-political zealots, Ordinary people, you doctors and and lawyers and nurses and construction workers and real estate agents and teachers and retired folks, you go. Go change the world. Go from here now. And let others know what I have done in your life. Love them the way I have loved you. Serve them the way I have served you. 
getting down on your knees and washing their feet. Invite them into this new way of life, this life with God where everything is forgiven and all is possible. Teach them all that I have taught you and form this community of faith where all are welcome, all are cherished, where lives are healed, where people are changed, where hope is given. Baptize them and train them and teach them. And then, you know what? Send them out. And then there is this great promise, right? Ah, got to catch the promise. And I am with you always. You don't do it alone. Remember, that power, that authority that was mine is now yours. Now you go. Go and, and turn the world upside down. I love the church. And I believe this so much. Do you see this great big vision that God has for the church? You know what's so amazing about this? Is these 11 ordinary guys, they went out and they did it. They turned the world upside down. They actually did what Jesus told them to do, empowered by the Holy Spirit and the presence of Christ. They went and they, they changed the world and the revolution that was started that day and on Pentecost 2,000 years ago, it continues today. And let me tell you, folks, the world has been changed. Think of the universities that would not have been founded. Think of the hospitals that never would have been built. Think of the mission agencies, the relief agencies, who are always the first to arrive and the last to leave. Think of all those things that the church has done. The church gets a bad rap. But let me tell you, folks, the world would not be in as good a shape today without the church. Amen. They did it. And now, Jesus says to us today, continue the vision. This is why we exist as a church. This is really what we're all about. To what? To go and do what Jesus told us to do, to baptize, make disciples, invite people into this life-changing relationship with God where they are made new and they experience the very life of God, this new life, this Zoe. That's our job, to invite them into this life, to train them up, to teach, to baptize, to send them out. And to do that mission, we, gotta, we have to, to accomplish this mission. We have to do many things as a church, don't we? It's a big vision. It's a big mission. And in the time remaining today, what I want to do is just look at two things we have to do to accomplish this. One, we have to be internally strong. And secondly, we have to be externally focused. To fulfill this mission, we have to do these things. So what does it mean to be internally strong? Well, that means we have to have ministries that serve the members of this church. We have to have ministries that, what, make us, that build us up as members of this church. Primarily things that happen here at 119. This is it. Build up the, the members of the church. Just like Jesus told us to do. Baptize and teach and train. To do that, we have to do a couple things really well. We have to have worship services that what? That inspire. That build us up. Where we come and we experience the very presence of God where we hear the word of truth every week that changes how we see ourselves and how we see the world and how we see each other. We need to have these worship services where we experience the very love of God every week. And we're inspired. Have to do that. Have to have education programs for children and youth and for adults to teach them what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It's a whole new world, isn't it? He changes our lives. We have to teach. 
We have to build up. We have to build a community of faith where we experience love and support and the grace of God through each other. You know, you're the greatest conduit of grace that there is to each other. Got to experience that fellowship. We have to have pastoral care where we care for people, one another, as we go through the inevitable storms of life, right? We have to be there for each other. We have to equip and train people to discover their ministries and to use their gifts that God has given each one of us in ministry. We have to do all those things. Be internally strong. The things that happen right here at 119 Avenida de la Estrella. (laughs) Bidwell was a lot easier. 208 West 1st Street. That was pretty easy. (laughs) So we have to do all these things. We have to be internally strong. And you know what? A lot of churches do that really well. And I think the temptation of the church is to focus there. But here's what happens when all we do is focus on what happens here on this campus and these things that make us internally strong. We get fat. And we start arguing over stupid things. I remember consulting with a church one time up in Sacramento, right across the street from our capital. Beautiful old church. Strategic place. Ministering to people who serve our state. And I was, they were having trouble. They were kind of stuck. They weren't moving forward. They weren't these horses, let me tell you. And so I'm meeting with their leadership team, their deacons, or elders, other key leaders of the church, and, and they're asking me questions. And I remember somebody raised their hand, and I was talking about how we structured our church in a new way to, to empower people to make decisions so it wasn't so it could get stuck in the centralized way of, of making decisions. But let the people who are out there doing the ministry make decisions and empower them to do that. And, one, and somebody raised their hand, and they said, you know, how do you decide what color the fellowship hall is going to be painted. And all of a sudden, I looked back. We were in the fellowship hall. I looked at the back wall, and here are like five different colors. (laughs) This was the big crisis in the church. This was what was sucking all their energy. And I kind of laughed, and I said, folks, if that's what is taking your energy, you don't have a vision. You're not doing what God has called you to do. And that is to go out. Go out. Go. Get beyond these walls. Go out in the world. And make a difference. And fulfill this vision that, that, oh, this beautiful, purposeful, Man, if you are looking for purpose in your life, which so many of us are, here is some purpose, huh? Change the world? That's a pretty big purpose. Don't get stuck fighting over things, but what? Externally focused, internally strong, externally focused. Go out. Go beyond these walls. And see, this is what I really want us to get today. If for some reason your mind wandered during the sermon, which I know never happens, come back right now. (laughs) Here it is. Somebody asked me once, as a pastor, if you could convey anything to your congregation, if you could see anything happen, what would it be? Wow, that's a great question. You know what I said? If I could do anything for every member of our congregation, here's what it would be, that they would see themselves as missionaries. That's how I got the title of the sermon, A Church of 2,000 Missionaries. We figure, I asked a number of people, how many people would call San Clemente Presbyterian Church their home church? And if they were pressed to say some church, what would they say? Most people said about 2,000 people. That's more than 2% of the population of San Clemente. 
Aren't you impressed with my math skills? For a history major, that's pretty good, huh? 2%, probably 3%. They say that if 2% of a population to decide to do something, it can happen. What I would love to see happen for every one of you is that you would see that God has given you a great purpose, a mission. The mission field is no longer in Africa and South America. In fact, Korea is sending missionaries to us. The mission field is right here. We are in a post-Christian era. There's no doubt about it. You can tell, can't you? And so as you go out, here's what I would love for you to know. That God has gifted you. When he talks about passing on the power and authority, he's talking about you. He has given you the power and authority. You're the church. These buildings are not the church. These buildings could be destroyed in an earthquake or something tomorrow. And you know what? The church would go on. You're the church. Wherever you go. That's what I wish more than anything. Because then, what? You're not stuck in the church building, but you're these horses running, doing what you've been created to do, empowered by the Holy Spirit, living with joy and purpose and meaning, doing what God has created you to do. That's God's vision for the church. Let me close with this story. I can't see what time it is, but I'm going to tell it because it's such a great story. Gordon McDonald, pastor in New York City, and when he was pastoring this church in New York City, he lived on Roosevelt Island, you know, that little strip of island in the East River under the Queensboro Bridge, and every day he would take a train from the north end of the island down to the, I think, the south end of the island where you catch a tramway and you go up over the river into Manhattan. Remember City Slickers, that movie? Well, that's what Billy Crystal was doing. He was in that little tramway going over to the over the river to Manhattan. So every day he would take these buses back and forth, back and forth. And so he got to know these bus drivers and came to find out that some of them were Christ followers. And so he and his wife, Gail, invited some of them over for breakfast on occasion, and they would talk. And during one of these breakfasts, one of the bus drivers said to him, he said, Gordon, you know, you have such a great job. You travel, you know a lot of people, you seem to be really enjoying yourself. And Gordon said, I love it, couldn't be happier. The bus driver said to him, he said, you know, you're, you're fortunate. All I do all day is drive this bus from one end of the island back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. What a life. So the conversation kind of went in different direction, but Gordon kept thinking about this, and after a couple minutes, he came back to the conversation. He said, you know what? I've got something I want you guys to try. He said, I believe that God has you there in that bus, and God wants to work through you in your job eight hours a day. I mean, think about it, folks. We spend... a." a 168 hours a week, we spend maybe an hour or two or three here. All the other hours we're out there. That's where God wants to use us. So he said, I, I think God wants to use you. So try this. Before you begin your shift, close the doors of the bus and stand at the end of the bus next to where you seat, sit and look out on those empty seats and say, in the name of Jesus, I declare that this bus is not a bus for these eight hours. It is a sanctuary. And the people that come through here, through this sanctuary, will experience the love of God through me whether they realize it or not. In the name of Jesus. He said, do you think you could do that? Someone said, ah, New York bus? Have you been on a New York bus? My sister lives in New York. I've been on those buses and subways. A New York bus? A sanctuary? One of the guys said, you know what? I could try that. Let's give it a try. Another one said, I could try that. Another one said, I could try that. And so over the next few months, whenever Gordon would get on the bus, he'd lean over to the driver. He said, is this a bus or a sanctuary today? (laughs) 
And usually the driver would say, this is a sanctuary, man. This is a sanctuary. So a few months later, one of these drivers met with Gordon again for breakfast. And he said, you know what? You changed my life. He said, really? Tell me about that. He said, well, remember when you talked about the sanctuary stuff? He said, you know what? I've been doing that. Every day. I stand up, close the door. In the name of Jesus, this bus is going to be a sanctuary where people experience the love of Christ, whether they know it or not. He said, I've been doing it. It's completely changed my job. Completely changed how I look at what I do eight hours a day. He said, the other day, Guy got really mad at me, cussed me out because I wouldn't drop him off any illegal stop. You know, there would have been a day that I would have just stopped and just let him have it. But I said, you know what? That's okay. Took him to the stop, dropped him off. Nice having you on board. Thank you. Have a great day. The lady behind me said, Charlie, why didn't you guy let that guy have it? How could you do that? And he muttered to himself, because I'm driving a sanctuary, not a bus. Sounds like a simple thing, but it's a paradigm shift, isn't it? So you teachers, here's my challenge. Application is very clear today, crystal clear. When you go to teach your class tomorrow, close that door before the kids come and say, in the name of Jesus, this is not a classroom. This is a sanctuary. Those of you who are real estate agents, when you're driving those people around looking at all the beautiful houses in San Clemente, it's not a car. It's what? It's a sanctuary. You financial advisors, you're helping people with a great service, how to steward their money. It's not a financial advising office. It's what? It's a sanctuary. You doctors, as you're operating, it's not an operating room, is it? What is it? Sanctuary. Try it. It's the beginning of the mission-oriented life. To see that God wants to use you. Wherever you are. Retired. As a grandfather. You moms. Driving kids around. Four hours a day in those minivans or SUVs. This is not a minivan. This is what? This is a sanctuary. See what God does. Let's pray together.